everyone and welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan and with me today our town manager Adam Chapdelaine who has come into the studio uh, to share with us a review of a busy, busy year here in, for him and for the community in Arlington. So Adam, we always enjoy talking to you. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it very much. Um, so like I said, I think we will just kind of look back at 2019 as we are now within weeks of its close. Um, and, uh, and just so much has happened. Um, so we want to just acknowledge that first and yeah. foremost. But also, I know you and the rest of, uh, of, of our local government, thoughtful people, uh, I'm sure you have taken lessons from a number of the things that happened um, over the course of the year. So we'll want to kind of focus on that particular, uh, that particular takeaway yeah. uh, wherever we can. Um, so we'll proceed roughly chronologically um, and going back to near the be nearer the beginning of the year, I wanted to ask you about uh, just to take us through what happened with zoning, bylaw, changes or proposals um, that ultimately after a lot of back and forth between uh, the ARB and, uh, and the zoning, and I think the ZBA as well, mm -hmm. um, and the community, the, the, the ultimate result was that these proposals were, were withdrawn before town meeting. So tell us both what the substance or content of those proposals was and a little bit about how that all kind of unfolded. And again, what lessons you've drawn for how to do things next time. Absolutely. So I think what we did in Arlington or tried to do in Arlington earlier this year is the same thing that's happening all over the metro region and frankly it's happening in many of the major metropolitan areas across the country. Many of us are seeing housing costs are rising out of control. Um, you know, many would say they're not rising out of control now. They've been out of control for 20 years and it's making it harder and harder for people really of any income level to live anywhere near where they work in the greater Boston region. So Arlington is definitely symptomatic of that, but not alone in that. Mm -hmm. So starting with a process that actually dated back into 2018, uh, led by the, uh, the Department of Planning and Community Development, we started a dialogue about ways that we could improve or enhance density along the commercial corridors to incentivize both uh, housing development and affordable housing development, and thereby also add some more vibrancy to our commercial corridors by putting some new redevelopment there, allowing mm -hmm. for new storefronts, new housing, foot traffic from those housing, uh, from that housing, and playing our part in the larger regional part of producing housing and hopefully, if not lowering, slowing the cost of housing in the region. So that's sort of the high level of what, we're, what we were looking at. Uh, so the planning department went through a number of community forums and information sessions, uh, trying, to, trying to find some community consensus around what the right steps were. I, and that's a typical way that the planning department approaches these kinds of things all the time, right? I mean, correct. Yeah, getting setting these hearings, uh, these opportunities, basically for the public to weigh in. Yeah, and in different um, formats. Right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it was the format of an actual redevelopment board meeting. Other times it was a community listening session, or even smaller group engagement to to learn from what uh, from residents what they were looking for. And I think what we found the good, the good news is I don't know that anybody as part of this process said that we don't need more affordable housing. That seemed to be a community-wide consensus that Arlington needs more affordable housing. The challenge is, what's the right way to do that? Is it through allowing more housing production in general, so both market rate housing that then allows for affordable housing? Is it finding ways to just produce affordable housing? And the, the challenges are there's only so much economic reality, or, or there, are, there are limits of economic reality of how to produce affordable housing. So I, not to jump to lessons learned, but I think one of the lessons we learned coming out of it is we need to do a better job of setting the stage of what the economic realities are of creating affordable housing. If it is true, in fact, that we have a community-wide consensus around the need to develop it, then we need to have a community-wide understanding of what it costs to develop affordable housing and what, what the realities are of developing it. So I think that was a lesson learned. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, when you say that, do you, do you mean that in general there seem to be less understanding of what would be involved um, if we were to go whole hog in that direction in the way that people could under could come together um, and there was broad consensus around the goal uh, there was less clear understanding about 
I mean, what the means yeah. were going to be, and and so having that conversation going forward, um, so that everybody understands what those means are, and then presenting, um, you know, alternatives to the to the voters, uh, might be the you know the a better or another way to go about it. Yeah, I mean, part of the challenge is we we hear a constant refrain again, not just in Arlington, all over the region, of we don't need market rate housing, we need affordable housing. And I, I understand that refrain, right? Saying basically, we don't need more eight hundred thousand dollar condos. We need more either rental units or condos that are affordable to people of a certain percentage of the area median income. I, I understand that, but still being a capitalist society as we are, when developers are looking at a parcel, they all the co all their costs and profit loss statements have to come together to have it make economic sense for them, and. I'm not the housing expert on staff, but my general understanding is to produce a unit of affordable housing, you need about $150,000 worth of subsidy to come from somewhere. So, cause, because that affordable housing unit is going to produce less revenue than a market rate unit. So without there being either direct government subsidy, which we ha can do on a limited basis, but not nearly on the scale or scope of what we would want to do, you need to have some other ability to produce that scale that is necessary to create those subsidies. And often, it, that it is through allowing market rate development that is then, re then requires a certain level of affordable housing. And that level can only go so high before that profit loss statement goes off its balance again. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think that's part of what we need to do, is have a more direct and explicit dialogue with the community about what those realities are. Maybe even bring in some developers who aren't working in Arlington now, or maybe don't even have an interest in working in Arlington, to talk to people. That would probably be better, yeah, right? Yeah, right, and just have a dialogue about what it costs to put a project together, right? If you're going to build 10 units and we're requiring 15% affordable housing, you know, how does that work? What does it look at 20% affordable housing? Then what does it look at 25%? And where does, again, where does the profit loss go off the rails mm -hmm. and start to get a better understanding of what it will actually, what it will actually require? And I think that will help us test what the commitment actually is to the production of affordable housing and get a feeling for, you know, what does the community really want to commit to uh, right. to produce affordable housing? Yeah, and I think that your experience in the community, both as deputy town manager and town manager for a, a long time now, um, I assume confirms that you feel like you can, if you can present the numbers and better information and stuff like that, like you said, a disinterested source uh, yeah. uh, as far as folks are concerned, a developer who's not interested, as you said, in uh, in operating in Arlington, who nonetheless will give the real numbers uh, so that people can chew on that, that I'm sure that you have confidence that, that the Arlington community members w will do so, will, uh, you know, work to understand that reality and to accept it as best they can as they consider what the right steps are to go to address this issue. Yeah, I'm hard pressed to think of a time at town meeting where a well-reasoned, detailed, you know, statistically valid argument has been made and town meeting hasn't supported it. I, I'm sure there's one and I'm sure there's something, but generally what you just said is right. I think if you, if you do the homework, you do the math, you do all the requisite backup work that's necessary, uh, usually you can make your argument. The, the other thing I would add in this particular case that I think we need to do better at, and I think internally we all agree we need to do better at, is providing graphical representations mm. of what proposed zoning changes would would do to the corridor. Um, we, we did have some that I don't think fit the bill, and I think we all internally agree they didn't fit the bill. Um, so as we start to talk about things in the future, and we're not looking for a spring of 2020, we're probably looking at maybe fall of 2020 or even beyond okay. that, I think we all acknowledge that we need to do a much better job of demonstrating graphically, what would these changes do? You know, what would it make XYZ parcel potentially look like if developed per the proposals? And give people a sense of what's either to be gained or lost from where, you know, whatever their perspective might be. Right. And I assume those pictures would save you and others thousands of words. Yes, uh, yeah. In fact, and Correct. that makes a lot of sense. But you just mentioned town meeting. Uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, again, as we're proceeding roughly chronologically through the year, Town meeting occurred as it always does in April and May, and um, a pretty full docket this year. Wondered if you had any takeaways from town meeting this year that you would like to share. I think it was it was one of the longer town meetings we've had in recent history. We had I think when I first started here we were at nine or ten nights 
of town meeting, and then we dipped down to four or five, but we were back up to, what were we, nine or ten again this year? I think it was, yeah. Forgetting, um, probably self protection forgetting how many nights it actually was <laughs> yeah uh, as my uh, as you know my wife was a, became a town meeting member this yeah. year and so yes those were also lonely nights for yes, me yeah. in the house right so I'm, I'm glad also to think that yeah we already maxed out on the p potential town meeting nights and future years are going to be better so anyway we hope <laughs> um so, yeah, I mean, I think that it, it was a very robust town meeting session, right? There was a lot of zoning talk, even with the withdrawals. There was a lot of dialogue before that. There was still some other zoning proposals that were debated. The accessory dwelling unit mm -hmm. um, article was, it received approval, right, of 62% of town meeting, but needed two-thirds approval, so it didn't pass. Uh, so there was a lot of dialogue about that. Uh, there was dialogue about the budgets. Uh, we had both an appropriation for the high school as well as the general town budget with the override included as part mm -hmm. of the debate. But I think more than anything, what, what I've seen this year and what I've seen you know, over my time working here, that the, you know, your work in proving yourself as a government or building trust for the community is never done. It's on a continuum. So no, all the good work before, though important, needs to be constantly maintained. And in the role of town meeting, we're looking at town meeting because there's turnover, because there's always new faces, there's always new residents engaging, there has to be a constant education process mm -hmm. so that the, uh, the voters or the town meeting members who come in have an understanding of what you've done in the past, what you're looking to do in the future, and how what you're proposing right then is based upon both of those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't want to say I didn't know that going in, but for, for some reason I would say this year that was particularly, you know, I was acutely aware of that. And I think we're going to continue to see that. We have a lot of population change in Arlington in general. People, people move in, they move out for whatever number of reasons they might be, and we see a lot of change in town meetings. So I think being aware as we go into this next town meeting session of the need to engage with town meeting members, make sure they're adequately informed about the matters before them, would be a major takeaway that I would take from the 2019 town meeting. Um, you, uh, I have a small question, and I realize it could be an embarrassing one for me, and that you know maybe I should know this. But you mentioned in terms of the accessory dwelling units that the uh, vote fell short of the two thirds necessary. Is it two thirds approval that's necessary for all warrant articles? Um, Zoning and certain finance articles. Okay. So general town bylaws no. Uh, general budget approval, no, but if you're changing zoning, right now it requires two-thirds. Uh, two if you are um, taking money, putting money into or out of a stabilization fund or free cash, or if you're trying to borrow money, that requires two-thirds votes. So that statutorily lays out, you know, it, it's, it's laid out statutorily what needs to be uh, mm -hmm. two-thirds vote versus a majority vote. Uh -huh. And, well... Well, thank you. We'll leave, we'll leave that there. I, I was about to go down a rabbit <laughs> yeah. hole, which our audience wouldn't appreciate, I'm sure. Um, anyway, looming over town meeting um, at that time uh, and subsequent to it right away uh, came the big vote, the kind of centerpiece of the year here in Arlington in a lot of ways, which was the vote uh, both on the override and on the debt exclusion for the, uh, for the high school. Um, on that debt exclusion for the high school, uh, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Um, lots of people working for a, a long time to, to make that uh, argument and to bring in the figures as they are for the, for the high school um, and the design, et cetera. Um, but here we sit in December, and already uh, it's, we've had word that uh, there's a, it, it could be running over budget by as much as 10% of the, the cost presented to the voters in, in, uh, in, in July or mm -hmm. June. Um, so what gives? What's, what's going on? Should we expect more bad news to come? Is this going to be comp this 30 million extra going to be compensated for with cuts somewhere else? Tell us a little bit about where, where things stand with that right yeah. now and what should we, we should expect. Absolutely. And I, I think the first thing I would say, not, not to mince words or to parse words, but uh, we're not over budget. We're overestimate, overestimate. For, for what it's worth. And really? I think, no, that's a good, that's, I think a, it's that's important. an important distinction. Absolutely. Just to Absolutely. make sure, I don't want people to think we, we, know we have overspent money that was appropriated or approved. Uh, where we thought we were going to be bu uh, budget-wise, the estimates are higher than that. Mm -hmm. So we're overestimate at this point. Yes. And I will try and, and, you know, any references I make to that going forward, I will make sure to be careful about that because you're right. It's an important distinction. Yeah. And people have written to me and said, well, how is this project already over budget? We haven't even put a shovel in the ground yet, mm -hmm. which is a fair, it's a fair question. So, mm -hmm. um, but to, to the meat of the question, 
So we started at schematic design, which is where you get at the end of the feasibility study phase. And you know a lot of things at that point about the project. You know what it's going to generally look like, where the building's going to be, where the classrooms are going to be. So you have to know a lot of things about the building, but you really don't have a design for the building yet. And that's why you start the design development process, and then at the end of that, you actually go into construction drawings so that you have architectural plans for a construction company to build from. Mm -hmm. So from schematic design until now, we're actually just at the end of the design des uh, development process, we've learned through the, you know, through the process a lot more details. And some of those details have illuminated that there's going to be more cost than what we had originally budgeted. Some of it isn't necessarily that the detail illuminated it, but we've learned that market conditions are driving higher costs in uh, trades like HVAC or electrical work that either the complexity of this job or just how much work there is in general in the market is driving estimates or pricing to be higher for some of these sub-trades that are part of the, part of the building. So that's, that's part of what's driving um, this overestimate figure. To get, you know, we have to stay at the $290.8 million figure. The MSBA requires it. It's the only authorization we have per the debt exclusion. So we need to bring what right now is a $264 million construction budget down to the $235 million construction budget that was part of the original 290.8. Mm -hmm. So we are going through a value engineering process that we're required to go through even if we didn't have to cut. The MSBA requires us to go through a value engineering process. And what that looks like is a long spreadsheet that talks about a lot of different things. Some very small things like how high the tile is going to be on the wall in the hallways and whether you're going to have tile on all the walls in the bathroom or what color brick you're going to have on the exterior of the building or are the windows going to be aluminum. <laughs> it's like or, a long spreadsheet. It's a very long, it's a, right now I think it's a, it's a five or six page spreadsheet and you go through and you make decisions about what you want in the building or don't want in the building and often you know there's a, there's a, there's a cost benefit on are we increasing maintenance costs, are we decreasing the longevity of the product or are we going to get the same, total same functionality for you know, using a different product. And you go through this analysis and try to figure out what the right things to do are. Also in that list are some bigger things. We're giving consideration to what exactly the HVAC system for the building will be. Uh, we had planned uh, 330 geothermal wells in a fully electric building. Um, we're still considering whether or not that's gonna be possible in staying within budget. Um, where the design team is committed and I think we all think it's gonna be possible to keep an all electric building which keeps our hopes of eventually a net zero building alive, but perhaps with less geothermal. These are all things we're looking at mm -hmm. right now. Uh, so that's one thing we're looking at. The athletic fields and whether or not they'll be artificial turf or just uh, normal uh, you know, grass mm -hmm. uh, is up for debate. Whether or not they'll have lights is up for debate. Um, but that's, an, uh, the good, that's a good example of us. Uh, we're trying to think at the same time about what can we do that can be made ready to be added on later. And the fields are a good example of that. So on this value engineering log, we have synthetic versus grass, uh, no lights at all, put the conduits in, put the footings in for the lights so that we can make a decision about how much money do we want to spend to make sure that, you know, maybe three years after the project, we spend, you know, the $600,000 to put lights up or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that ripples throughout the entire buildings. There's some things you can cut and never get back. There's other things you can cut, but know that you can add on. Right. Later. Prepare for like like what people do in their own homes. Exactly right. When exactly. When right. they're trying to figure things out, and you know something might need to be deferred, and if possible, you just want to prepare the ground for it, and and then and yep. then do that. Exactly. Um, who are the when you say we 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 as you were just doing throughout the uh, throughout your answer, um, who is who are the decision makers? Um, around these things? Who's looking at the spreadsheet and, and wrestling with what, you know, with tile to field, hmm. these kinds of decisions? So it's definitely a we, right? The, the we is big. Uh, we have a 19 member high school building committee. So it's the building committee. So that's the, that's the, that building committee holds the authority around all these decisions. So by not, by maybe next week, if not next week, the week following, the committee will be taking votes on all of these value engineering items. We've already taken votes on a few, I think about $3 million worth uh, to close the gap from 29 to 26, but the, the bigger ticket items are still up for debate Clearly, yeah. and vote. Uh, so that's, that's the we, and that we has uh, town officials, the superintendent, myself, Jeff Thielman as a school committee member and is the chair of the committee, uh, Chrissy Allison Ampey as another member of the school committee, 
uh, general residents with varied expertise. Some are construction um, industry experts, some are marketing experts, uh, some are educational experts. Uh, we have our own educational experts in the high school principal and vice principal. We have teachers on the committee. So we have a pretty broad base of people from the community, both working for the community and living within the community, serving on the high school building committee. But the other sort of half of that whole process is our professional team. We have HMFH architects who are the designers for the project. We have Skanska, who are the owner's project manager, or OPM, who basically serve to represent us working with the architect mm. and with the construction manager. And the construction manager we hired is Consigli Construction. Uh, so now that team has come together to serve as the project team or the project experts. So we sit at a table with probably now 40 people around the table having these discussions. And then the meetings go long. You know, they're, we're probably averaging three and a half hour meetings wow. uh, to get through all of this. But we definitely have a lot of very um, sharp people around the table. Um, we have John Cole, who was chair of the Permanent Town Building Committee for, I don't even know, 20 something years, a professional architect sitting around the table. Um, we have a, a woman who works in construction at Harvard. We have just newly joined an architect at Stantec. We have a professional engineer in the sustainability industry, Ryan Katowski. So we have, we have a lot of brain power around the table from the community helping us to get through these decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think just to wrap this up, um, I want to just confirm what I heard from what you were saying, which is, you know, yes, we've, it, it, has, it has come to public attention that there's a $30 million uh, increase in that estimate, as you said. Um, but to those in the know, um, this is not a surprise because this is the kind of thing that would happen in any project where, you're say, where you move from having just uh, the basic elements of design to actually looking at uh, things in more detail. Yep. And I assume that it's very predictable that when you do that at this stage of the process, things do go up yes. as opposed to down most of the time. Just like when you start to do the actual construction, likely the surprises are going to cost more money yeah. uh, rather than lesser, the things we couldn't anticipate. Yeah, I, I think that is well said, it's accurate. I mean, I think it's also important to say we're not happy about it. I mean, we don't wanna have to make some of the decisions we're gonna have to make, but I do think it's, it's the norm to some degree in projects in general and becoming unfortunately more of the norm with big projects like this. Belmont, uh, who's about six months ahead of us, has went through almost the exact same thing Attleboro right now is facing almost the exact same thing that we're facing. So we're not, we're not alone in facing it, uh, but I do think there's something, there's, there, it is sort of common in the process. Mm -hmm. I'd also add, and I said this at a high school building committee meeting, this is, it's not dissimilar from if you were doing a $50,000 kitchen renovation in your house and that was what your budget was, and then the contractor came back and said, I ran some further numbers, I got some more detail on the cabinet costs or whatever it might be, and it's gonna cost you $57,500. Like on a percentage basis, it's the same math. And I, you know, I actually said to the committee, I, probably half of us around this table have had that experience where a contractor's come back and said, said that. So again, it doesn't mean we're happy or Great. glad to be dealing with it, but it's not totally outside the realm of right. normalcy or reality. Doesn't mean that something is wrong. Yes, in exactly. Fact. And I exactly. think that's really important for people to understand. So in addition to the debt exclusion, we also had the override pass. Mm -hmm. And um, again, to remind people, an override is something that even excellent fiscal management as we have in this town is going to be necessary over some period of time because Boy, I've heard this a lot. So I can say that Project Two and I mean Proposition Two and a Half, limiting the amount of increase in everybody's property taxes every year, doesn't conform to the rise in in costs, costs. of providing yeah. services in this town. So therefore, periodically, we're going to have to deal with this kind of thing. Um, again, congratulations in thank you getting the approval, especially in conjunction with the debt exclusion, because it's a big hit mm -hmm. for all of us. Um, but on that, I wanted to ask you about the budget. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we do now have you operating in a post override, you know, in an approved override atmosphere, so that's good. Uh, but I know that uh, here we sit in December, early December, and this is a time when departments are very busy all, all, all across uh, the town getting their departmental budgets together to hand, uh, you know, to get to you um, so that you can, and you can do the final work. Um, so I'm curious about, you know, when it comes to the departments in town, are there any that are 
particularly challenging in terms of trying to limit the growth in their own budgets? Um, and if so, you know, what are those and why? So we, we start every budget season giving our departments budget instructions. And for the past seven or eight years and going into this next fiscal year, the instructions are generally, please provide us with a level services budget. What's it going to take you to run your department this year the same way you did it last year? We then also give them an opportunity on a separate sheet to tell us other things that based on what they're seeing in the community they think should be added to their budget. And then we take those into consideration. So I think the top line thing this year that is a, a budget driver is an increase in the cost of solid waste removal. So we uh, are contract for bringing uh, trash, not recycling, but trash, to Wheeler Brader ends uh, at the end of this current fiscal year, and we've signed a new contract for the start of next year. And it's going to be about a $90,000 bump. Uh, so we normally have about a 2.5%, I think it was a 2% bump every year uh, from the prior contract. This was an 11% mm. bump. Uh, it then evens back out, but there was a sort of a one-time adjustment at the start of this contract. So DPW is facing that, and generally that has an impact on how we're putting together the town budget. Aside from that, I would say across departments, we're fairly, I think we're well situated today. Uh, DPW in general is always under the gun for more resources, whether they be personnel or resources in general. So I think that's outside of the solid waste, that's an area that we'll pay a lot of attention to as we go through this process. Uh, another area that is feeling a lot of pressure is public health, uh, with the homeless population down in the Thorndike Alewife area, uh, with uh, growing mosquito concerns, rodent concerns. Uh, we have more and more of a need to make sure that we're adequately staffed in public health. So I haven't had our, my meeting with the Health and Human Services Director yet, but I know those pressures are there, so I'm sh sure when she comes in to sit with me, that will be something that we'll have to talk about. Um, outside of that, there, there's not, nothing else jumps off the paper at me or off the chart mm -hmm. at me as you know, departments that are going to be looking for more resources. But we do, you know, we try, we, we, we talk all year, right? So I generally have a very good communication process with the department heads, and there's not a lot of surprises as, what, you know, into, as, as, as far as what we think we're going to need as part of the budget. But you know, when things are happening in the community, when changes are happening, you know, we need to try to stay abreast of that. And if budgetary adjustments are necessary, then that we consider them. Well, let, let me get a reality check from you on, on something. Uh, I've talked to people in town um, who, um, who are noticing and don't know what to make of. Um, I'm not sure if a proliferation is an overstating it, but some increase in the yeah. number of positions uh, in town government and senior level positions, it yep. seems like. Um, and wondering, really, do we do do we really need uh, these people? We're five and a half square miles. You know, we seem to be functioning fine. What's the scoop with this? Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the reality there? So I think it's you. You started that point great, right? We're five and a half square miles. We're forty-five thousand people. So we're not we're not a huge community, but we're not a small community. But my experience has been that because of our proximity to Cambridge and Somerville and Boston, that more and more we have residents with a high level of expectation in terms of the types of services we're going to provide, as well as the level of professionalism our staff is going to have and the type of things that we're going to undertake. So in particular, uh, you know, we've put a lot of focus on planning over the past couple of years. I think it's almost five years ago now we created an economic development position. We created or we made more robust an environmental planners position. We've created a transportation planners position. And I think it's actually been five or six years that we've had an energy managers position, which started in facilities but now is in planning. And I think that ties in well with the level of expectations that, that I see from the community. They want us to be in the forefront of climate change resiliency. To do that, you need professional planning staff, as well as engineering and administrative staff, to put together grant applications, plans, documents, whatever it might be. Um, people want safe, efficient, affordable transportation. They want safe roadways. They want complete streets. Those things don't happen by accident, right? That you have to have a very planful mindset that engages the community to come together with those plans. That's why we created a transportation uh, planner's position. Uh, people want vibrant storefronts. People want a vibrant economic districts or, or commercial centers in the Heights, in the center, in the east. Again, those things don't happen by accident. I mean, in general, there's the private market that will do what it'll do. But if you want 
if you want an additive from the government, you need to staff that. You need to do those things. And if in more broad, uh, broad strokes you want to be a sustainable community, you want to go after green communities grants, you want to get solar panels on the roofs of your schools, you want to build a net zero high school, you want to have community choice aggregation, you want to do all these very progressive, important things, again, they don't just happen. You have to staff them and you have to provide the staff, to, uh, staff support to do it. And that's what our energy manager does and has done over the past number of years. So I think that these are all positions that are important for the community to talk about. Because if there's ever a time in the future where the community doesn't value those services, then we should talk about those positions. But sitting here today in 2019 and going forward into uh, 2020 and fiscal year 21, I think the community values the services those, those positions provide very, very highly. And if we weren't doing those things, I think we would be criticized pretty strongly. And in fact, it's funny that, it's funny that uh, you know, I brought up those, those positions those are still the areas where we are highly criticized, that we're not doing enough about climate change resiliency. We're not doing enough about uh, renewable energy. We're not doing enough about becoming net zero well before 2050. And I think we're doing all we can within our resources to do those things, but it's those places that we've added professional high-level staff where we still receive a lot of public criticism for not doing enough. Yeah, I think people hear that a new manager has been, has been hired and there is an assumption that, okay, there's going to be, things are going to, you know, kind of rocket yeah. ahead from yeah. here because we didn't have somebody doing that before. We do now. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, that's their job. So we're just yeah. going to wait and see, you know, you know, make sure that, uh, that they're, they're earning their keep, so to speak. And, and, you know, so that's probably, in a broad sense, it's probably somewhat unrealistic, as, yeah. you, as you point out um, quite persuasively. But at the same time, um, just to... To take one one of the aspects that you were just talking about, economic development, yep. um, it is both a place where I think we can see that there's been uh, investment planning, new ideas, you know, be it the beer garden or other things, um, that really are meant to enhance um, our prospects for generating more commercial uh, income here, et cetera. I think also um, people see in conspicuous locations, empty storefronts, continue to see those. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, again, I, I think what I'm asking for once again is a reality check from your perspective for our expectations because uh, should, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way, is it uh, fantastical of us or um, you know, kind of quixotic of us to think that we can fill all those storefronts. Um, is that a viable goal or aspiration or not? And if not, why not? So I would say it's probably quixotic to think that every storefront will always be filled, right? Because there's the natural business cycle. People will open business, close business, some businesses work, some businesses don't work. So I think there's a natural churn. Uh, so the five and 10 in the Heights, that, that comes to mind. A lot of people lamented them closing. I, I did too, right? That was sort of an institution in Arlington. Mm -hmm. But nothing wrong happened there. The family decided to retire after a couple generations of being in business. I mean, I, I read all those stories like looking for, like, what did we do wrong? What did the community do wrong? And I don't think anybody did anything wrong. They closed. And they're, I don't know where they went, but they're, you know, they're retired. a and happy they're, retirement. They're having, right. uh, having a happy retirement. Yeah. And, and now there's a, a proposal to put a pub, the, uh, the Heights pub, there. Uh, but the, you know, the process takes a little while. Um, but to, in, to, in terms of that reality check, um, it's very costly, right? To outfit an older storefront in an older building, it's very costly. So finding a small business owner or an aspiring small business owner that has the capital to come in and build something that's attractive to people living in Arlington or in neighboring communities, it's capital intensive and it's hard to do. Uh, so I think it's not, it's probably fantastical to think that all storefronts are always gonna be filled, but it's not fantastical to think that we can have increasingly more vibrant commercial centers. And I think we are better than we were a couple of years ago before we passed the vacant storefront registry. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I think we went from, at that point, near 30 vacant storefronts down to, um, I think, 12 vacant storefronts. Is that right? And it's ebbed and flowed from there, right? There's openings and closings. And I know the Heights have, are particularly um, in worse condition right now than the center in East Arlington. But I, th I think even right now in East Arlington, we're, I think we might be down to one in uh, East Arlington, Christo's market recently closed. Mm -hmm. And then before that, I don't even know that there was a, 
Yeah, you're I right. As I as I think anecdotally about passing through the the uh, East Arlington corridor, it does it does seem like uh, everything is filled. And, um, and I do so, and I think a lot of this connects actually back to the discussion we had earlier about zoning. That if you want vibrant storefronts that are going to be resilient, or vibrant commercial districts that are going to be resilient against the Amazon effect or the big box store effect or whatever it might be, it's probably more the Amazon effect now. Mm. You need to have foot traffic. And you need to have a good mix of businesses, right? You need to have daytime business that are going to put foot traffic into places that serve lunch and dinner. You need to have service businesses. And I also think you need to have people <clears throat> that live there, right? Like people have to come out of the neighborhoods to support these businesses. Businesses don't operate on the desire for vibrancy, right? Businesses operate on customers. So we have to find the right way to find that right density mix to, to provide customer uh, businesses an opportunity to succeed, right? I do think a lot of it in East Arlington has to do with the fact that it's a little more dense, the people live very close to the business district and can easily access those businesses on foot. And they can go buy breakfast at Quebrada or coffee at Burismo, go have breakfast at the Arlington Diner, go get lunch at Anthony's Eastside Deli, and then go to dinner at Sugo, right? It's all very close to, I live in East Arlington. So yeah, I, 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 I know, like I know my places, if, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if that's it's your a, daily itinerary. Yeah, not every point. day. Not, not, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do think that's part of the dialogue back to zoning about, um, you know, outside of just affordable housing, what, what are the right strategies to increase the vibrancy in our commercial centers? And I believe, from a statistical point of view, and I think there's a lot of studies on this, that you increase foot traffic, you increase vibrancy, because there's just more opportunity for businesses to succeed. And I do think that foot traffic, again, this is speaking anecdotally, et cetera, but um, it does feel like there's been some, some uh, incremental progress around that uh, in and of yeah. itself. I yeah. just do see, it feels like. Uh, see just more people out and about on uh, along the Mass Ave corridor. Yeah, specifically. I agree with that. Um, okay, changing gears. Uh, there's a, another story that actually began at the beginning of the year, but continues to unfold here at the end of the year, and that is the retirement of our longtime uh, police chief Fred Ryan uh, back in January, and um, and then the assumption of his duties by the acting uh, police chief Julie Flaherty, and the things that. That we've that the police department has had to deal with since then, yeah. uh, which we will touch on shortly. Um, but uh, it might. It, but and then there's the search for the new mm -hmm. um, for the new chief, uh, permanent chief. And um, so m my question is really, um, how do you looking back on how everything has worked this year? Uh, let's go back to that theme that we set out at the at the start. Have you drawn any lessons from both, you know, the 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 support that that uh, that Chief Flaherty, Acting Chief Flaherty, has had mm -hmm. uh, for stepping into t tough shoes to fill in yeah. general and and a tough time right here in Arlington, um, and also the search for the new for the new chief has that been going as planned as predicted? Uh, if not. What's, what's gone awry, and again, what lessons would you draw from, from that? So I, um, I think I, I know there are lessons to be learned, but I struggle to know what could have been done differently from putting Acting Chief Flaherty in the position she was put in to deal with the challenges we've faced in the police department over the past year. Mm -hmm. um, at the start, I had committed to a process where anybody in the department of rank could be considered for the Acting Chief's position. When Fred had um, thought about leaving for the MBTA three years earlier, actually four years earlier, at that time I had said I would only want to look at candidates who weren't interested in the permanent position. Uh, but to make sure that we had as wide a pool as possible when I knew Fred was going for certain, I changed tack this time and said Any, anybody who wants to go for acting can go for acting whether or not you plan to seek the, the position permanently. Um, so I, mean, I guess I could look at it and wonder, you know, think about whether or not I could have done it like I did four years prior, and maybe that would have made it easier for whoever the eventual chief would be. But that said, I don't, there was no way around, and I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, there was no way around the challenges whoever the acting chief was going to face regarding uh, right. this situation, the, the, the Lieutenant Padrini situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, but, and I have to be honest, I've said this to her and I've said it publicly, I can't imagine a more challenging situation for any police chief to come into than the situation that we've been dealing with over the past year. In general, you know, again, separate from uh, the Padrini situation uh, that we'll, we'll take up uh, the, 
the, the majority of the rest of our conversation, I think. Um, but in general, um, how does it work when you're transitioning such an important position from one person to another? Uh, do you ideally hope that there will be some mentoring, some, some opportunity for mentoring and for bringing that person up to speed? Um, or is it really just completely situation dependent on, uh, you know, the, the, the lives of the people involved? Particularly in this case, for instance, I think to myself, well, wouldn't it have been great um, for Fred to have been able to, again, ease the transition yeah. for, for Chief Flaherty um, in some way? But I don't suppose there's anything written in stone about how to do this uh, necessarily. Um, and again, whether you might observe or whether you might take from this whole uh, from this whole unfolding of circumstances something that you could apply should this ever arise again. Well, I guess what I would say to that is under civil service, having there be some type of transition period would have been much more challenging. I do think that now that we're out of civil service in the future, we could have a better opportunity to say, who, to, you know, whoever the permanent chief is, you know, to have a dialogue about please give me X amount of time of notice before you think you're going to retire or potentially leave so that we can go through a hiring process and make a decision about who your successor is going to be before you leave <clears throat> and put in place a stronger transition plan. To some degree, this civil service process, which relies you know, on, a, on a test and an assessment center and gives you a ranked order list of people who you can pick for what is probably, um, you know, maybe even putting, pushing myself and the superintendent aside, the most important job in town, or at least you know, in the top mm -hmm. most important jobs in town, to have that selected via a test, I just think is incredibly antiquated and doesn't serve the community well. Um, with the process we have now, I think in the future, I would, I would strive to do something more like what you described so that uh, whoever was coming in could have some type of ramp up period. Mm. Um, to, to jump from a captain's role into the chief's role is, is very hard. I mean, technically, the, all, you know, the, the police department is very technically sound, and I have faith in all the captain's ability to technically be the police chief, but to jump in and have the soft skills and the ability to work with the community and the ability to work on the budget that you've likely not worked on before, those are all very challenging things. Right, and, especially since, as we know, Fred Ryan presided over quite the transformation in, in, in culture and orientation yes. in a lot of ways of the Arlington Police Department, much more towards, as you said, softer skills um, and, and, and seeing themselves as kind of uh, woven into the fabric of the Arlington community in a slightly different way than police departments traditionally have, perhaps. Correct. Correct. Um, so that, you know, that work is continuing to need to be done. And again, that's just, that's yet another thing yeah. to pile yeah. on the plate of the new, uh, of the new chief. So where do things stand with the search? So right now we're, we have an assessment center, which is the process we're going to go through to basically test and assess who the candidates should be or who, who we should select to be the next police chief. Uh, and we have that uh, assessment center scheduled for January. We had been hoping for it to be scheduled in October, but the Ranking Officers Association had asked that we delay that so their members could have some more time to prepare for it, which in, in, the, you know, in the, the desire to be harmonious and have this be a smooth transition to the permanent chief, we're happy to do that. Um, so, though we would have hoped to have a permanent chief by now from our initial plan, mm -hmm. moving to January, you know, it's, it'll, it is, it'll be what it'll be, and hopefully it will maintain that, that harmony within the department. Great. Um, can, I, can I add, I do want to add mm -hmm. while we're talking about chiefs that, um, you know, we lo friend Ryan yes, left after uh, 20 yep. years, but Bob Jefferson, who exactly. was chief for uh, over a decade and a member of the department for, I think, over 30 years, retired this year as well. So Thank you very much for, for bringing that up. I apologize. No, to you. no, no. It's, you know, Chief Jefferson, actually, for, for, for that oversight. But anyway, carry on. So just, just to say, I know sometimes the fire department's much more quiet than the police department in, in the dispatch of their duties. And, you know, hopefully we don't have big fires where they have to be less quiet in the dispatch mm -hmm, of their right. duties. But... Um, I mean, before I came here today, I was thinking about this year and having two very long-standing, exceedingly professional, exceptional chiefs retire and having that changing of the guard happen in one year. That's a, that's a big year uh, for, from the public safety perspective. So I just think it's important to acknowledge that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Bob Jefferson retired and is doing well in retirement. I still see him in town. And his successor, which was selected via the civil service process, Kevin Kelly, has stepped in and has been doing a great job. Uh, continuing to lead the department in their professionalism. Again, thanks for, for, yeah, for mentioning that. Um, 
So, I don't need to remind you or anybody else when I say, unfortunately, in a sense, when I say the name uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, we, we know what we're talking about. There's been a, uh, a controversy that will not uh, abate mm -hmm. um, about what to do, about, um, you know, not, not only um, have you, from my observation, been subjected to a lot of scrutiny and criticism around the process that, as, it has, as it has played out so far, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there is also still great concern about what's to happen from here going forward. Mm -hmm. So it's a big topic. Uh, I know you've spent untold hours on this already, but what I'd like to ask you is, as you think back on what has happened so far over time, again, lessons learned for you, um, and anything that you wish you had done differently, that you would do differently at another time, et cetera, and then we'll talk about what the options are, if any, mm -hmm. going forward. So I think a few things, uh, and I've said, some of these I've said before publicly. Uh, I think the major one is, I, I've, thought, I've, I've thought on this, I've slept on this, people have asked me, I would still do the restorative justice process if I could reset and start all over again. But I think I would have focused on broadening the participation in the restorative justice process. I have received observations or criticisms that you can't do a restorative justice process with a whole community because you can't include the whole community. Because if a whole community was harmed and every harmed party is supposed to be part of the process, then you can't do it. Um, I do think, in, again, in hindsight, that if we had broadened that circle or, or, or layered the circles or found some way to bring more voices in at that, at that circle process, we could have done better. Do I think it would have put us in, in a totally fine position and not have to have the dialogues we're having now? No, I don't think it would have fixed everything, but I definitely have learned that lesson. Um, I think the other thing I would say, and I don't know if this is so much a lesson learned or an obs a lesson learned or observation, but, uh, and this goes a little bit back to education of residents. Um, I think I would have said more in March and in April, I think it's the timeline of when I released public statements, would have said more along the lines of what I said in um, August or July when I released the more detailed letter. Because I, I think there's been this continuing problem with people not understanding the rules that municipal government has to play by. I've, I've talked now to dozens, not, not, you know, not even just a handful, dozens and dozens of my colleagues in various cities and towns, and literally to a person, not one of them believes that a termination would have been upheld with an arbitrator. Some of these are people with 30 years experience, five years experience, you know, all, all along the gamut, most of them having gone through labor arbitration disputes. And again, not one of them has said to me they think an, a termination would have been upheld. None of that forgives what Lieutenant Pedrini wrote or says that any of us thinks what he wrote is okay or that a termination shouldn't be pursued if all things were being equal, if all things were considered equal. But under the rules we play by, you know, or on, and, and my job is to play by those rules, if we had terminated him or, or, or pursued some type of discipline beyond what we did actually pursue, uh, we, we do believe that an arbitrator would have put him back to work without all the dialogue we've been able to have and will still be able to have. So it's, it's, hard. it's hard to say this, it's hard for people to hear this, but I think people who are really concerned about this issue to some degree are focused on the wrong issue. If you want to be able to hold certain types of public employees accountable, you need to look at the systems that diminish that accountability. And looking at this one decision I understand the criticism. I've tried to talk to people about the criticism. But if you really want to take on the challenge, you really want to affect change and make sure things like this don't happen in the future, then you have to look at the system and take on the system. Talk to your state legislators. Talk to the governor's office about the civil service system and the labor arbitration system. That's, that's the core of this issue to mm -hmm. me. And I have challenged some people to look at that, and they've not taken that challenge because it is easier to criticize the specific issue rather than looking at the systemic issue. But on, all, on many matters, if not most matters, if you really want change, you have to change the system, not, not the one output of that system. Right. And who knows, again, how many situations, quite frankly, like this, where that system seems to be working against 
what people would want and mm -hmm. what would seem the most just outcome. Who knows how often that is the case versus where the system is in fact protecting people that the community or, or, or interests that the community would indeed support true. Very in true, most yeah. places. So it's, it's tough, again, like you said, to, uh, to say that because the outcome in this case is lamentable uh, in a lot of ways, that, that that means that the system has to be changed. Um, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. It's a, that's, a, that's a tough one. But nonetheless, as you, I'm sure, I'd be very surprised if you couldn't tell me that you have talked about this or heard about this within the last week. Um, it, it continues to be an issue of concern for people what's going to happen with Lieutenant Pedrini going forward. Um, and so what I want to ask you is, like, what options are there realistically? Can, as, as, as I understand it, Lieutenant Pedrini right now is restricted to uh, working within the, build, the, the, the police department building um, and is not, uh, at this point, getting out on the street at all, which seems to be, him being on the street is, seems to be a concern for a certain number of people in town. Um, can that, can, if, if I have correctly described that situation at the moment, can that continue indefinitely? Can that continue until, uh, you know, Lieutenant Pedrini opts to retire or do something else? Um, or is, you know, can, is that either, is that or any other option um, that people, that might make, pe might, might, might um, assuage people's concerns to some degree? Um, it, how viable is that or, or any others that you might be considering? So I will say, to be clear, so his assignment is a desk assignment. He is the detail, he's the uh, lieutenant in the detail licensing and traffic unit. But he is eligible to work details in overtime. So he does have some exposure to the street, uh, to be, okay, to be thank clear you. about that. Thanks for clarifying. Um, and generally, yes, we feel as though the chief has the management rights to keep any personnel in an assignment um, in perpetuity or indefinitely. So it is possible. I think myself and the chief have wanted to at least hold open the option that he could return to a street assignment at some point, and we've promised full public disclosure before any such decision has been made. But we have said for the time being he's remaining in that assignment and he won't be put off, he won't be removed from that assignment again until there's some more public dialogue about that. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable, I'm very comfortable saying that. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've been in dialogue with those who, you know, have, have had, have criticized you, frankly, yeah, yeah. and scrutinized the process and found it wanting, yeah. um, and are concerned about things going forward. So just if you don't mind uh, perhaps repeating yourself for the umpteenth time about this, what are, what is your understanding with, within those conversations about what you will be doing about this going forward? So, so the mo probably the most important or the, the next thing we're doing is putting together a set of community conversations. Uh, we're working with a facilitator who has had dialogues with me, dialogues with members of the community, some of the concerned residents that we're talking about, and she'll be putting together a report on what her suggestions are for what the community dialogue will look like. I'm expecting to see that very soon. You know, it might even be in my email right now. <clears throat> At the request of the concerned residents, um, we're not going to hold any of those meetings until January so that we can get through the holiday season and not have people have scheduling conflicts around these meetings. So the hope is sometime in the next week or so, we'll see what those meetings are going to look like, find some dates, announce them to the public, and then hold what will likely be a series of meetings uh, through January and February to start the dialogue about where we go. Uh, probably address the restorative process and, and talk about harm and then try to carve a path forward for community healing. So that's, that's the first aspect of what we're doing. <clears throat> we're also simultaneously contracting with Visions Incorporated. Uh, they're a, a group that works with a diversity of organizations, a diversity and inclusion in organizations, uh, to come in and do a third-party bias assessment of the police department. So Acting Chief Flaherty is working with them to outline what their work will be. They'll come in and work with members of the department uh, over the course of a number of months and then put together a report, uh, likely with recommendations about how 
you know, how to address any the presence of bias as they might find it, or what the department can do uh, can do to maintain or upgrade its its uh, you know efforts to be as diverse and inclusive as possible. So that's underway. Uh, outside of what was specifically requested in the petition, uh, we're also working with the National League of Cities and their Race, Equity, and Leadership Division to bring training to town department heads and other supervisory staff in the town. We're looking at a list of about 50 or 60 town staff to go through what would be months-long training uh, in race, equity, and leadership. They have a curriculum that's based on the Government Alliance for Racial Equities curriculum that boils it down to a racial equity toolkit for government officials to be able to look at their systems and things happening in the government and make sure that there isn't institutional or systemic racism or bias in those in their programs, processes, or whatever it might be. So we're going to be starting in January with a training called Real 101 that goes to then 201 to 301 and 302. Uh, we have the date for 101 picked out and further dates to be planned. Uh, but we're going to be go undergoing a pretty rigorous training uh, with a um, significant amount of town staff on these issues. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I would add, we're very close to uh, making a hire for our first ever diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator a position that was included in the FY 2020 budget. Uh, we've gone through a recruitment process, and maybe in the next week or week to 10 days, uh, we're hoping to have an announcement about our first ever uh, person to be serving in that position. Um, appreciate, as usual. <laughs> the thoroughness and comprehensiveness of, 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 your, of your answer. Um, I did want to ask you one uh, last thing, and this is uh, uh, you know, a little bit more on the personal side, because um, you know, I've had, I have to say, this is the way I'm going to put it, I've had the pleasure of dealing with you uh, officially and, and interviewing you over the course of years now. I know that you have are held in extremely high esteem in this community, and with good reason. Um, but I also know that you have had that sense um, for much of the time that you've been working as our town manager. This year has brought more criticism for you um, and put you really, uh, you know, in, in the bullseye for a certain number of folks. Um, so let me just ask you, I mean, how, how has that been for you? What, how you doing, yep. uh, in a sense, and, uh, and, and what do you make of it? So admittedly, it's been very challenging. And a resident actually wrote to me last week or over the Thanksgiving holiday to express concern, but also express appreciation for, in general, my work here in town, which I appreciated on this issue, on the, on the Lieutenant Padrini issue. But I did say back to them that what has been, what has been frustrating is that I, I do, I'm not an ego-driven person, but I do feel like collaboratively and working with other people a lot has been achieved here in Arlington over the past decade. And much was achieved in the decade before that, but I, I do feel good about the work that's been done and the things we've been able to move forward on and the things that we've been leader, leaders in the Commonwealth on, on many issues. And I do feel like there's uh, people in the community that have disregarded all of those achievements and are judging me and the town to some degree based on this one issue and I suppose it doesn't matter if it's fair or not but um, but it, it's been it has been challenging right I you know I think uh, I've, I've spoken to other people I've spoken to you about this before I've taken plenty of personality tests and I know you know the general personality type that I have and I I'm a pleaser I like people you know I think it's what motivates me to work hard in this role to to keep citizens happy, to do all that we can within the resources we have to keep citizens happy and feeling like this is a good, strong community that supports them and supports their quality of life. So to not be doing that in some people's eyes is challenging. And you know, I don't know that there's a just like a closure to that answer, but um, yeah, it's it's been a tough year dealing with this. Fair enough. I, I appreciate your candor. Um, you know, I'm going to let you go now because. Uh, as I said, we've had uh, many conversations over the years, and um, this was a tough year. Tough year, busy, busy. Yeah. Lots of achievements as well. We've covered them as well. Yeah. Um, but a tough year, and um, so <laughs> to make like this it, by extension, I assume this has been one of your more grueling conversations with ACMI, uh, just kind of going back in such detail over so many things. So, as always our appreciation for your willingness to do it, for you doing it again with, not just with candor, with clarity and speaking directly to the issues. We always appreciate that. We know that we can count on that with you. 
and uh, we will continue to do so in 2020 and, and beyond. So um, thank you very much You're welcome. for coming in, and we look forward to our next conversation with you. We always do. Same here. Appreciate it. Thank Adam. you. For our town manager, uh, Adam Chapdelaine, uh, this is Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and appreciate your being here.